Thank you very much for uh, joining tonight this uh, fourth uh, Cambridge Creativity Meetup. Uh, I'm Sasha Kostulovic. I uh, run the, the, this Cambridge Creativity Meetup. And tonight, uh, I'm very, very uh, delighted to uh, welcome uh, our uh, speaker. Uh, she's a, a fashion designer. Uh, and then she will tell you a bit more. It's a very, very, her story is very, very interesting. Um, uh, about how uh, she uh, decided to uh, maybe change the purpose to an extent uh, of her business, of her fashion business, for a good cause. So please uh, welcome, push the hand clap button uh, to give a big welcome to Sam De Cruz for you tonight. Thank you. Hi, how are you? So, um, oh, let me just get my gallery right so I can see. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm Sam De Cruz and um, I'm here to talk about um, making to make a difference, but also the journey of an artist and finding your purpose and how it actually um, is, is very difficult to know what your purpose is in, in life and especially within work. Um, and you know, you hear all of these stories of how projects just blossom and bloom and you know, they're really organic, um, but actually, it's just kind of digging into into that and where the purpose is and where it comes from. So to kind of start, it's really important that I just explain a little bit about my family background. <clears throat> that will make so much more sense later on. But um, I am um, from Derbyshire and I grew up in a single parent family with my dad and my brother. And um, my dad, he was a really good man, but he was an alcoholic and um, we he was he was never violent he was quite emotionally detached a lot of the time and he had his own struggles um by the time i was kind of like 18 that's when i left home i'd already been hugely creative and kind of thrown myself into creativity and i knew that i wanted to to pursue it as a as a career but i wasn't quite sure i just knew that making i i, I kind of connected dots making go to college to do fashion because that's a thing that's a career and then where do I want to go I want to go to the best so I had my eyes set on St Martin's um, and I went to art college and um, at the same time I did oh, I did my GCSEs and I went to art college and I applied for a couple of universities and to St Martin's but I didn't get into St Martin's I got into some other colleges and I said to my dad can I um I'm going to go for St. Martin's. And he was like, you know what? I just can't support you in that. I want you to go to Derby, I think it was. But he was drunk at the time. And I was just like, you know what? I'm going to move out. So at that point, I moved out of home and I applied to go to St. Martin's again after doing an A-level and then also um, a foundation course, which was really creative. You kind of like delve into different disciplines. And I got in, so I moved down to London, got into St. Martin's, and that should be really where your creativity thrives. But for me, it actually was dampened. <laughs> and um, I was, well, I was too busy enjoying London, to be fair. And I had lots of good fun and I was drinking a lot. I'd had a very, um, I'd say, unhealthy relationship with alcohol. And that's been like throughout, throughout my life and obviously seeing it with my dad. Um, so I didn't get the best out of St. Martin's and I almost, it was almost like I wasn't in the right place, but I had worked so hard to get there. It's almost like I felt like I had won when I, when I actually got into the, the college and I didn't work as hard as I should have done. And this is all in hindsight. But actually, it's given me the drive afterwards. So what I'm going to do is share my screen because I've done a little presentation. I'm good with, um, it's very visual. So I can, I'm going to talk to you about, oh, hold on. Yeah, here we go. So making to make a difference and actually finding your own path. 
So different ways that artists and independents can make a difference. And then I'll talk about businesses who are doing it really, really well at the moment. And then also finding your own path. Um, I'm not talking about large corporations. That's a whole different ball game for me. I'm talking about the individual or somebody just starting up doing a project or finding your own way. Um, Cause obviously I can relate to that myself. Okay, so there's like fundraising and then raising awareness. If you're an educator, community work, or um, if you're designing something that's like inclusive to um, different groups, which was brought up by Matteo on the last talk, which was really, really interesting. So, you know, there's so many different ways that we can all make a difference. And that's, I think, if you look at it more as like making a difference to a small group of people and then it grows rather than thinking of the, the you know, like I'm going to change the world. Um, so, the, you know, there's so many different ways that we can all do it. And if you look at, um, these are the companies that I've kind of looked at. So Help Refugees, I don't know if you know them, they've got the campaign, the Choose Love campaign. Um, they have partnered up with um, Catherine Hamnett. She did the um, Choose Life um, t-shirts. And in 2015, they, um, it, it was started by a girl called um, Josie um, Norton, and she's like a PA to Coldplay. So she's really within the kind of celebrity sphere. Um, she saw what was going on with the refugees, just thought, you know what, I have to do something to help. Um, and so it was a very reactive kind of beginning to her, to her, her project. So they started a, a hashtag and um, there's Dawn Porter, Liana Byrne, um, Bird, she's a uh, radio DJ, and then Danny Lawrence, she's a volunteer who started working, but then is now part of the group. And um, from this like celebrity driven force, they have built up such a huge and amazing um, like charity. So it's Help Refugees, and they've raised 10 million pounds um, since 2015 and they've helped 722,000 people um, with 25,000 volunteers across the world and they've gone into I think it's like they've got 80 projects going on throughout the whole of the world so just from one person thinking I need to do something, I need to help, how can we do this? They started the hashtag to um, collect clothes and blankets. They then, um, they got so many, they were hiring vans. I mean, these are just the girls who are, cele you know, they're celebrities, but they're just, just girls and women with families and they managed to get people to help and they have gone on to create a wonderful, wonderful environment. And their um, slogan is um, a simple but powerful mes message that goes straight to the heart of everything we do. And that is just choose love and help. <laughs> so that's, that's my first one. So this is like a very reactive kind of way of making a difference. You see a problem and you think, you know what, I have to do something to help. Now, the second one that, oh my gosh, when I, when I first read about these guys, and when I've been doing some research today, it just sends goosebumps over me because they are incredible. So they're called Social Bite. Um, they're a cafe up in Edinburgh, and they were set up by a guy called Josh Littlejohn and Alice Thompson. And basically, they set up their cafe um, and in the centre of Edinburgh, and a homeless guy came in to um, ask for a job. They gave him a job and that was nine years ago and from them working with him and obviously getting to know his story and knowing the impact of homelessness and, and what it has on youngsters and his obviously his journey there, um, it's, it made them think I have to do something. So they started off with um, pay it forward. So a customer would come in, they would buy sandwiches, and they would leave a couple of quid in the pot so a homeless person could come in and then 
that had some food. So customers were paying it forward. And it's such a simple idea, but it took on and it really took hold. Um, and then from there, I mean, it's grown so hugely. Now they're the largest provider of free food in the whole of the UK. Um, they arrange a, 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 an organized like sleepover and it's been in Trafalgar Square, it's been in Times Square, all over the world. And that's raised eight million pounds where people go and experience a night sleeping outdoors. Um, so I guess it's connecting them with understanding what it is like to sleep outside without shelter. Um, but also, you know, raising that eight million pounds that goes into many social kind of projects that they're doing. And, and one of those is Social Bite Village up in Scotland. They're working with, um, with the government up there. So they have, if the, the government has some land that is vacant, they've gone in and they've built prefabricated houses, two bedroom houses. So obviously um, a homeless person can come in and like share with somebody else or maybe as if they've got family or whatever. Um, and so they're building small villages to house the homeless. They're also employing all their cafes, they employ social um, homeless people. And they have basically changed the landscape of homelessness up in Scotland. I mean, one cafe. And they started in 2012. I mean, I just find them absolutely so inspiring. Um, and that was, for me, that part of the... Um, what they've done is that's just been very organic. They started with an idea for a cafe and then a homeless person came in and it just evolved. It's just something that rolled along. It was very organic. So it wasn't particularly, well, obviously because of the success, it's been thought about along the way, but they didn't set out to do that initially. So that's one way that it can start. And then um, Humans of New York, I don't know if you've heard of them, or the, the book. So it's it's a blog that started out by a guy called Brandon Stanton. And he was, I think he was like a stockbroker, I hated his job, and then decided that he was going to be a photographer. He'd never photographed before, um, just a bit here and there, but he, it was his passion, but he hadn't done it professionally. He moved to New York, and he decided that he was going to start a project photographing the humans of New York and posting them on a blog. And um, that's what he did. He just posted the photos. And one day he took a picture of a lady and she was all in green. And by this point, he'd started building up some followers. And um, there was a, you know, it's interesting. They're, they're just normal people. People can connect with other humans. And so the project was interesting. Um, and then anyway, he took a picture of a lady in green. She was all green, green hair, green jacket, green, um, I think she got a brolly and a little pull truck, like a trolley that you pull the shopping trolley. She was all in green. I probably elaborated that slightly. I don't think she had a shopping trolley. Anyway, um, and then she, he was speaking to her and um, she said, oh, I used to dress in all different colors of the day. I, I used to dress every day in a different color, but now I only wear green because it makes me feel so good. And he said that that picture he put that caption on that picture and that was the first one that he actually wrote a caption with it. And the comments at the time, he said, went wild. I mean, this is at the start of his blog. And he said that he was getting 30 or 40 comments and that was big for him. So then he was like, okay, I'm onto something here. So every time he took a picture of somebody, he started to chat to them. He then started to interview them. And then it turned in that he would have a picture and he'd have a, an interview and that, that's basically how it rolled. Now he started in 2010. His stats that he's got now, so on um, Facebook, he's got 19 million followers on his group. And on Instagram, he's got 11 million followers on his group, on his um, following him. So he's built, he's written books. Um, he is a, basically he's now turned into a, a, a philanthropist sorry, and um, he uses his platform to help other people grow. So he interviewed recently, he, he's gone all around the world and he's interviewed um, a lady over in Pakistan 
and um, basically she has a um, a foundation like a charity um, for is the bonded labor liberation front so basically in um, Pakistan there's a thing where um, if you're needing a loan for money you can go and borrow some money but you pay it back by working in the kilns where they're producing bricks and stuff and this happens all over Pakistan and basically the way that the contracts are written is if you um, you take the loan you're basically giving them your time to to work but the loan keeps going up so you're never actually repaying it so you and your family become tied to the to the the work that you're doing and your basic is just like modern day slavery so there's this charity who's working to help kind of break all of that down so brandon took a picture of her and her portrait the lady who owns who runs the charity and he um he interviewed her put her on the blog on his blog and she said to in the interview that she was looking for donations so he put that out and he got such great feedback from that and people wanted to help he did a, a just giving page and he set the target for a hundred thousand dollars in 72 hours it raised two million dollars and now it's two and a half million that that's raised and that's from 76 thousand followers who've donated so he's using his platform he started with an idea He's rolled that idea and he's worked really hard. He's written books, but now he's using his platform for the power of good. So he's making a huge difference. And it's not through monetizing his project. I think he, he donates his um, profits from his book to charity as well. He earns his own money through doing freelancing and working on projects and talks. I mean, he's worth $10 million. So he's, you know, he's a really, really smart guy. But the way that he's worked, like making a difference is through philanthropy rather than, um, well, that's just the way that he's done it. Okay, so then the third lady, uh, the fourth person that I'd like to talk about slightly odd selection but you'll see later on as we go down um, why I've chosen her but she's called Bethany Vernon and she is a sexual educator and a designer. Um, she's written a book called The Boudoir Bible and it's all about uninhibited sex and um, she's also a hypnotherapist and she teaches people, um, <clears throat> just opens up the conversation about um, sex and sexuality and working to um, have a pleasurable life and she exhibits throughout the world she's like she educates people and she's really authentic in who she is so she's really um, making a difference to the people who are in her community and um, she can make a real difference to their their lives personally so those are the four kind of examples of like organizations or people that I really admire who are making a difference. So when you're trying to like find your own purpose in life, it's not, I, I found it quite, it, it's like a, a winding road. <laughs> um, and I've realized now that it's all about self-awareness and being authentic and alignment and timing. Um, so I've called it like a retrospective because you're literally going to see like where I started um, to where I am now. And that's like 23 years worth of creativity. Now, there's one thing that's been constant throughout my life, and that is creativity. Um, pretty much everything that you see, I've, I've made myself. Um, and it's helped me in so many ways. And now I'm just feeling like it has to, I want it to start helping other people. Um, okay, so when I left college, I, well, first of all, when, at college for my final, um, my final collection, I did it really, really badly. I got a third, um, but I loved the concept of my degree, uh, my, uh, my final collection. So what I did was a questionnaire that 
I gave to five of my friends and got them to fill it out. And from that questionnaire, I got a little bit of an insight into what the favorite films were, what the favorite colors were, what's happy moment, all of these kind of things. That then I kind of compiled a, an image of them and then I designed a garment to match their personality. Like my lecturers hated the idea because they wanted everything just on a model, but I was steadfast in what I was doing, but my execution of it was absolutely rubbish and I didn't spend enough time on it. And looking back, well, it is what it is. Anyway, but what's funny about it, as you'll see later on, it was a seed was sown. There's something within that collection, within the idea that is very much a part of who I am and it's being inspired by other people. So after college, um, St Martin's, I was like, you know what, I'm legging it. I met my husband, well, my partner back then, and we went traveling for two years around India and whatever. So I basically ran away. Um, but when we came back, I was ready to go, ready to get stuck in. I was way more creative than I'd ever been at college. And I was at a place that I wanted to just start my journey. And um, I worked in industry and like, in at Jaeger and Hardy Amos and lots of different places that were really quite of a high quality in terms of production and um, the technical side, which is what I loved because I love making. I didn't never really felt like I fitted into what fashion is and the seasonal things or the people. I felt quite um, intim yeah, intimidated or I wasn't worthy or whatever. I just didn't feel like I fitted into the fashion lot. So I stayed very much within production. Um, and when I was at Jaeger, I met a lady, not at Jaeger, but during that time, 2002, a lady called Sital. She was introduced to me um, with a friend, by a friend, and she's absolutely incredible, really, really inspiring woman. And she came to me with an idea that it was her absolute passion was recycling and, um, and giving back to the community. So she started up a social enterprise and she wanted somebody to come in with her to design so that I just jumped in and um and I was with her or we were together for like six years and looking back it's got everything that you know you it was a social enterprise we were making some really beautiful clothes um she she was got really into the whole community I mean we're talking this is like 20 years ago she got she went to um, 10 Down Street to met Tony Blair to talk about recycling and how it's so important and sustainability all of these kind of things and it was naively I didn't realize how well we were actually doing but when I look back, we did very well. So we got into Vogue and L, and these are like this is <laughs> these are one of my bags that was called Lulu. Um, so all my stuff, I'm kind of like a little bit off the wall with my design. Um, that's I'm it's very much like creatively drawn rather than looking at gaps in the market. But you'll see that as we go on. Um, so this was a project that actually could have been amazing. It could have been one of those companies now that, you know, 20 years later developed into something huge, but something wasn't right. And whilst doing it, like preparing for the talk, it's made me really think about all of this and where, where things didn't gel. And it's all about timing and alignment. And we were both starting a family. I had a little boy in 2003 and then 2006. We moved away, we were in London, we moved away. So I was in Hertfordshire, she was in Ryslip. And I think essentially it was her baby. It was her, she was staying up all night, looking into recycling. She was networking like anything. She was doing, she was really in there. She got, she was in and it was her baby. And I didn't have that. I had the creativity and I was designing for it, but that what, that's what was missing. Anyway, so moving forward. Um, 
So yeah, it doesn't matter how good the opportunity, there has to be alignment for success. And I think that is just so important. That's when I look back at Sari, that's why it didn't go further than it actually did. So after Sari, and or during while I was working with Sari, I was freelancing as well. And I did a bag of um, a collection of bags for a company called Lorna. And this really kind of like, it kind of cemented my love for made in England, um, handcrafted, really looking at design and um, <clears throat> how the beauty of making and making, you know, by hand, I wasn't into mass production. So I did the collection for them. As you can see, they're more design, more creativity over design because not particularly practical. Um, so I just did one collection for those. And then my husband and I, we started to want to work together. So we, he was a, a photographer and <clears throat> uh, he's a retoucher, he's a photographer as well. And we did a, a project with some guys. Now, the reason I'm putting this one in is because it links through from Lorna because you can see the bag here, but also this scarf here with a, with a neck, like a, a dog collar. That was just designed as an aesthetic thing. That's because I just like the look of it. But that particular item, I didn't know then was gonna really lead a good five years of my life <laughs> and take me into a really exciting world. Um, okay, so Andy and I started up Darkest Star and Darkest Star is a song from Depeche Mode, if any of you are Depeche Mode fans. Um, and it was all about, Initially, we made bags and um, purses and put art within the linings. That was our initial idea, but I haven't got any pictures. It's too long ago. I haven't got any pictures to show you of that. But then I started to do the study of an orchid. So um, I was in, like painting on canvas and then embroidering onto it. I did sculptures. It was like it was an ongoing project. It went on for quite some time. But this was a source of information of like inspiration. And then we started making bags, and I was doing origami um, orchids. And um, we always sold enough to keep keep in you know interested in it there was always something else going on somebody else wanting something so it was never we never made loads of money straight away it was always just kind of going on um so for the purpose of all this was really exploring creativity and i really wanted to make a success success of the business i really wanted to have a successful design label um, but without actually understanding what success meant for me and what it takes to become successful within that field. So that does involve either big funding or it does involve mass production so you can get your margins down. All of these things that doesn't sit in alignment with somebody who likes to make. <laughs> so it's I had big visions, but I didn't particularly have the um, the knowledge or the or the, the the kind of want to find out because I suppose I did have the knowledge. We just didn't want to do it. So Sitow introduced me to. She was working, so we still remained friends, and she was working in a um, with a guy, and they were making kimonos for. Coco de Mare. I don't know if anybody of you know it, but it's um, a luxury. This is, it was owned by Sam Roddick at the time. So really luxury, high-end um, shop selling beautiful bondage and um, like equipment and underwear and all of, all of that kind of thing, but absolutely beautiful stuff. And Sitar said, I was like, my project the um, study of an orchid developed into the pleasure garden because in Vauxhall, um, they, they, it, it was a garden and um, this is like in the 90, like 1910 or something. And it was like, there was like orchids within there and they had, um, it was quite debauched in the evening. So we, I did a, a pleasure garden project, which then I was introduced to Sam Roddick and it went into Coco de Mare. She wanted me to do 
the front window for two weeks I had an exhibition so I thought what can I design that will stay in Coco de Mare after the exhibition's finished um, so I designed a pleasure pillow which was a big pillow with my orchid print on it which basically sits in your room nobody would know what was going on but it turned into a blindfold and you could tie yourself on it I mean for me it was obvious <laughs> so that was like my route into having something in the shop after we'd gone and the scarf that I okay so yeah this is like emotion and opportunity driven rather than working a strategy like I said before this was just I literally went and designed through emotion through opportunity and I, I've got such a, a kind of overactive imagination I kind of fitted it all together and so the, I went to see Sam Roddick and I just took loads of stuff with me and I took that collar that I showed you in that other picture and she said oh I love your bondage scarf I've been wanting to develop one of these for years um can I do one with you and I was like yeah of course and so from this thing that I designed which was meant to just be an aesthetic thing it, it had long like silk that I thought you would just kind of like well tie around yourself but I, it wasn't I wasn't in that scene I'd um it wasn't a part of my kind of like environment at all but because she'd seen something in it, I then started designing scarves with Coco de Mer and they sold really, really well. And from there, the whole erotic phase of Darkest Star started moving. Now, I felt like you have, like, I needed purpose. When I was writing blogs, I needed to put purpose in there. But it was almost like it was, I totally believed it because my whole way that I wrote was, encouraging women to take control of their own pleasure and I absolutely stand by that 100% and but it wasn't part of my it wasn't part of my everyday life so that's why I brought up Bethany Vernon before because this is what she did she's really successful within her business because she lives it every day that is what she's doing she's enhancing people's pleasure whether that's through therapy whether it's through writing so for me it was like it was a design thing and I was blogging but and I eventually started going to like the clubs just to be part of it and just to see what's going on because otherwise I'm totally like an outsider and it was a really good fun part of our lives but it was not something that was ever gonna stick so anyway, this was, that was part of like our evolution and a really, you know, good, a good part of it. But for it to really build and, you know, to sustain a community, you have to be authentic. I mean, we still sell the scarves. A lot of people love our like core collection and we still, we've got a supplier over in Amsterdam that we sell them to. Um, so, you know, they, they still are successful, but in terms of it growing into something meaningful, I think you have to be living, you have to be living it. So at that point, I was still wanting to move forward, keep pushing, keep pushing, moving. How can I make the business, the brand be more successful? So I wanted to do London Fashion Week and we got into Fashion Week um, with the British Fashion Council. And I did a, a collection with an artist. She, I created the exploding cherries and then she painted it and then we printed it onto fabric and stuff. And it was all about ideas. And I think this is where, where I have, um, I wouldn't say gone wrong, but I, ha with the, I haven't had the, the business and the strategy attached to it. it I've been an explosion of creativity and that's what this kind of collection was more about rather than sales we didn't sell anything at fashion week not one bean but we did get some really good press so this is where we started getting noticed by the fashion lot and from spending so long at st martin's and feeling like an outsider and then working within the technical side of fashion and feeling like I didn't fit in 
to design now i'm being like in the front cover or well in the sense spread of v magazine with Gigi and bella hadid so i was like validated this for me was like a big part of of um, my business was like i feel like i've been accepted um but i didn't know where, where we were particularly going with it um i just wanted it to be successful um and built you know i didn't have that strong strategy that you need to make something work um, so then we did a sleeve collection. Our sleeves sold really well and we got huge amounts of press from our sleeves. So we did a sleeve collection, just checking time. And they did very well in terms of press. We, we got a lot, of, um, a lot of press from the fashion art. But what was it that I was looking for? And I think at this point, it was more validation than anything else. And obviously to make a profit, um, but at this point, we were just kind of ticking over. And then we did a lover collection. Um, now I'm kind of like, we got into some really cool shops in London and I'm starting to think about creating collections for buyers, trying to make it more business-like. And this collection, we got into a shop or two shops and I thought that we were just on the verge of making it but actually it was this one that pretty much they bought into us and then it didn't sell. And I'm like, ah, oh. it was just like, you, you get to a point and you think, yes, we're doing it, we've made it or we're making it. And then it kind of comes down. So it's such a journey, um, but you keep going, you keep going. Oh, and I, didn't mention so that was 2017 in 2015 my dad passed away and he died um it was a really traumatic death and it was alcohol based he was given a year to live and if he didn't give up alcohol he would die he gave up for eight months and literally a year to the day he 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 was he died um and it really affected me. It was it was heartbreaking. And so as soon as he, when he died, I looked at a charity call. I just typed in Google, National Associations of Children of Alcoholics. I, well, I typed in Children of Alcoholics and National Association came up, which is a charity called NACOA. And that was, a moment when I started to understand what purpose actually meant. Well, take a step back. When my dad was dying and I looked at him, it was like, okay, something has to, I have to do something about this. This is just not cool. Um, so that was the moment when purpose came and slapped me around the face. And then it slowly, slowly through grief and understanding slowly started to seep in actually what my purpose is um and so the, the the thing that i could do is i could make stuff and i've got like you know my label so i did a, a little collection for lovers I called it lovers unite and i did a t-shirt and i slapped lover across the front of the top of it and i sold like 40 t-shirts made a couple hundred quid for the charity um and just thought that that's kind of what i was going to I was going to do that and run marathons and all of that kind of thing to kind of raise money and kept plodding on, plodding on with, with Darkest Star, trying to make it kind of into something that gave me some, something more than what it was. And we, we got into London Fashion Week again with the British Fashion Council, and this was in 2018. And at this point, I was looking to build the business and show at fashion like in London then I wanted to go to Paris and then I wanted to build up my stockists but this was like a pipe dream this was like me thinking like this is what I want to do but actually not looking at the data not looking at a strategy and as you can see if you look at this collection how different that is to who I have been from the last 10 years like the colour has gone <laughs> I'm looking I mean, everything is made beautifully and each, each individual piece fits 
beautifully and it looks great and they can really like you know turn an outfit into something special but look at the color it's gone something happened and at that point at fashion week something died and at the same time Andy he my husband he was like you know what I've had enough of fashion I've had enough of this I can't do it anymore um and somebody said to me when well, I was talking to them about lovers unite and they said to me you can't just slap lover on the front of a t-shirt and hope to sell some if you're that passionate about it you've got to do something about it um and that really really stuck with me so at that point I was like okay just gotta step off the wheel give yourself a break you know all of these years working so hard just trying to make something work and not understanding what it is that you're trying to make work and so we did Andy was like, I can't do Darker Star anymore. I've got to concentrate. I mean, he's built up his photography and he was really like, he's a very talented man, but he needed to do his own thing and explore his own thing. This was mine. It's the same thing as what happened with me and Sitow. That was her baby. That's why I couldn't run with it anymore. And it was the same here. Darkest Star and everything, all of it was all me. He just supported the hell out of me and took some really beautiful photos, but it wasn't him. So we had to kind of like, we never said Darkest Star is dead, but inside, inside it was. And then this was my, after I'd been like numbed from Fashion Week, this was my response. I sat down and I got a pair of sleeves that I got in the studio and I just embroidered them. And this is what kind of came out of it. And on the inside, I've got them stuck on my wall here. They're kind of pinned up. I'm going to do a sculpture out of them one day. But I've got tattooed on the inside through thread is to live an authentic life. And that was what I thought I, you know, from now on, that is what I have to do. Um, and that's basically where Child Of has, has come. And it's been bubbling away now for two years. But it's a, a project that is getting my absolute attention and um, this is where I'm at. And I really feel now I've found my purpose because we're exploring addiction and recovery in a creative and contemporary way through storytelling and art, powerfully illustrating the value of sharing your experience. So I am talking to adult children of alcoholics and those touched by addiction having an interview I'm like having an interview with them from that interview I'm creating a piece of art and from that art it will inspire a product whether that's a scarf whether it's a, uh, like a, a a piece of art to hang on your wall there will be products that can be bought that are inspired from that art which will raise money from NACOA and other affiliated charities we are then going to have a website that is going to be a community and a hub of information about addiction and creativity um, that you'll be able to buy the products from, but also really start to understand the impact that alcohol it has on a family and what addiction has on a family, and also look at mentorship. Because I believe that breaking the cycle of addiction is two pronged first side is we look after the child so I work with NACOA and support them through fundraising um, children go through so much as being a child and alcoholic um, whether that's guilt low self-esteem there's so many different stats it's all on my website so you can see that I didn't want to kind of drown you with stats here but um, we look after the children and then also the addicts like the addict they are responding to pain and trauma and they're numbing it, they're self-medicating and they've lost their way in life. So we need to look at the addict non-judgmentally. We need to have compassion and love for them. And when they actually have managed to come through recovery and they're taking steps to make a better life, we need to be there to support them. So I'm, I've mentored a couple of people. I've got one girl who now, who I should, um, She's called Sasha. She's incredible. But um, she's been an addict for many years, homeless for eight years, 
and now she's working in the studio with me and she's an integral part of the project but we'll be looking at doing workshops and mentoring for those in recovery as well um my first conversation I've had was with an amazing guy, um, a playwright, British award-winning playwright called Simon Stevens. He did the um, Curious Incident of the Dog of the Night and Fatherland um, and Seawall. If you haven't seen Seawall, it is amazing. It's with Andrew Scott. I've interviewed him and he really opened up about his his life and his family. His dad was an alcoholic. And from that conversation, there's so many different artworks that can be inspired by it, but I've taken one which has got absolutely nothing to do with addiction, but it was a dream that he had when he was the, um, the dramatist for the Royal Court Theatre. And he was in a predicament that he felt like a, an imposter and he had a dream and it changed his career. So I've illustrated the dream and this is just an example of how the project's gonna go. So that's his dream. And this is part of an artwork. He escaped into creativity when he was a child and he went into role play and obviously writing. And um, he had a character for himself and he was the brave crusader. And this is when he was at primary school. And I've embroidered that. It's a double sided embroidery and it's all about, um, seeing things from two angles but also the shadows that's that's part of it so there there you go that is me and my story about finding purpose in your life thank you very 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 much sam uh wow that's what uh what uh, how to say progression what a story uh <laughs> and there is so much to to unpack from that uh, thank you again so much, uh, Sam, for um, uh, participating, for being our, our speaker tonight. <laughs>